So I'm just going to click two more buttons and we will be going fine. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, ElderWorks is very glad to have you here for this very important topic. My name is Dina and I'm one of the team here at ElderWorks and I'm happy to be able to um, be part of the team of ElderWorks where as a non-for-profit, we assist seniors with all aspects of aging, from aging counseling, advocacy, senior housing referrals, referrals to stay at home, as well as education. And today's presentation, Dilemmas of Caregiving from Burnout to Self-Care, is being presented today by Chris, our Director of Education, who is a registered nurse. She is a Dementia Reality Master Trainer. She is our Director of Education. She has done caregiving for her family and has a wealth of knowledge. And so I believe you guys will very much enjoy today's presentation. Please do put your questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And then if you have um, any questions about aging, aging needs or any resources, please feel free to reach out to us here at ElderWorks. You can reach us directly at the office at 847-462-0885. Ms. Chris, take it away. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm gonna just get rid of um, a couple of things here that will be in your way and um, All right, we should be ready to go. So thanks everyone for joining me today for Dilemmas of Caregiving from Burnout to Self-Care. Many of us will be called upon in our lifetime to become a caretaker for someone, a caregiver, a partner, a family member, or a friend. And some of us have already been called upon to do this. And uh, some may think uh, I didn't sign up for this, but here I am. And in the words of Rosalind Carter, there are four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Uh, today, we're going to explore the biggest crisis in caregiving, and that's called caregiver burnout. So today, um, our objectives, we're going to talk about caregiver burnout, common feelings with caregiver burnout, how caregiver um, caregiver burnout affects someone physically and emotionally, tips to prevent some burnout, and sources for assistance for those caregivers out there. So almost every caretaker experiences burnout at some point. If it doesn't happen and it's not addressed, the caregiver eventually becomes unable to provide good care. And so for this reason, caregiver burnout can be harmful, not only to the person receiving care, but the person that is giving that care. A large study in the Journal of Gerontology Trusted Source uh, found that even that caregivers who felt that they were under a lot of strain had a greater risk of dying than the people they were taking care of who were, had little or no stress. Here's some of our statistics um, that are uh, relevant to caregiving. Caregivers of someone living with dementia often face great emotional, social, physical, and financial costs. Um, so caregiver burnout is very common. Nearly one in five, that's about 19% of people are providing unpaid care to an adult with healthcare or functional needs. More Americans, about 24%, and that really has risen, are caring for more than one person, which was up from 18% in 2015. And then most family caregivers, about 26% have difficulty coordinating care. Um, and we saw that uh, was a rise from 2015. More Americans are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And again, that's increasing. We're gonna see that go up also. All of these are gonna go up because the uh, baby boomers are reaching the, um, you know, the, as I call them, the wonder years. 
uh, family caregiving spans across all generations, from baby boomers to Gen X, Gen Z, millennials, everybody's out there um, helping out. 61% of family caregivers are also working. Persons living with dementia with caregivers have lower Medicare costs than those without them. Most dementia caregivers are women and over a third are daughters and more women caregivers live with that person living with dementia than men do. Um, care, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, women are more, uh, they were born to be caregivers and more nurturing in many aspects, but also because women live longer than men and that really kind of uh, skews those statistics as well. We have some special caregiver groups um, among those, the sandwich generation. And this is the group who may have put off childbearing and raising a family till a little bit later and now find themselves not only raising a family, but being a caregiver as well. I had my first child at 25, the average age in my demographics of baby boomers. But because people are living longer, I did experience about 10 years of my mother living with dementia. And although I may not have experienced caregiving uh, for full time for all those 10 years, I still had the responsibility of my mom full time during a portion of that time. <clears throat> I also cared for my husband and I also cared for his father in our house um, for about two years after he had a stroke. And um, at that time, I had uh, three kids in high school and on their way to college. So I could not quit work. I had to keep working and caregiving. Much of the population today in the United States works full time. The demand to make ends meet financially is clearly evident. And as other culture groups, such as Asians, who typically would stay at home and be responsible for caregiving, not only as a parent, but also as a caregiver of their parents, find that many, uh, for many, this is no longer possible. Because <clears throat> of a person living with dementia group frequently does not like to be disclosed uh, their sexual orientation to their healthcare provider, um, I'm sorry, because of uh, the LGBT group, they don't disclose their uh, sexual preference to their healthcare provider because of fear of uh, repercussions. They frequently, frequently do not reach out for help and also because many are not recognized as married by their healthcare providers and that may risk uh, the lack of funding necessary to their care. So again, what I'm saying here is in our LGBT group, um, they don't have maybe that biological family that takes care of them. They um, are sicker longer by themselves because of the um, stigma. So a lot of times there's difficulties on uh, getting caregivers in that particular group. <laughs> Excuse me. Very cultural, uh, various cultural groups have different ideas about caregiving, but the one thing in common is the value and the dignity that goes along with that culture when caring for others. So whether you look at any of these um, here on the screen, the message is we all want best what is best for our, our family member, our friend, uh, our spouse, and that is dignity, respect, and good health. Some causes of care, uh, caregiver burnout, you might see conflicting demands. And that's as you try to balance the needs of the care recipient, uh, coworkers and employers, family members, and yourself, you've got all these demands that are bouncing off of you at one time. You feel that there's a lack of control over other things such as money and resources, maybe the lack of skills that is needed to effectively manage a loved one's care. It's not unusual to hear about a caregiver going home, uh, taking care of someone who has a trach, or um, maybe someone that uh, has a feeding tube and the family members are now responsible for caring for that person at home. 
So there's really that lack of control over the situation. There's also a lack of privacy because uh, caregiving may leave you with little time to be alone with your spouse, your loved one, or your family member. <clears throat> we found that lack of privacy with my father-in-law uh, because we had a two-story house. We did not have any bedrooms on the first floor. And so we had to convert our um, family room into a bedroom. So that kind of moved and shifted our family into more of the formal um, front room, which we then kind of allocated for uh, for ourselves. But but that still was taking care of someone kind of in the middle of our common space. Um, not that we have any regrets and it worked out wonderfully, but when we talk about all these different as uh, aspects of caregiving and what causes those burnouts, um, you know, this is the list. There's uh, something called role confusion, difficulty separating your role as a caregiver and as a parent, as a sibling, or a spouse of that care recipient. Unreasonable demands uh, placed upon a caregiver by other family members or persons being cared for. It's real easy to care for a family member when you live three states away and you have someone else taking care of that uh, you know, someone else in the family taking care of that family member, um, it creates a lot of conflict because the family member who's doing the caring is trying their best to do their best. And you have this other family member living out of state telling you what they think should happen. So a lot of times, not only is there role confusion, but there's a lot of conflict uh, within the family unrealistic expectations about the effect of caregiving efforts. Um, we'll have loved ones with progressive diseases such as Parkinson's disease as Alzheimer's is, you know, um, there might be family members that feel that you can get them better. They may not understand the disease process of things like Alzheimer's disease or, or Parkinson's disease, which there are uh, it's a progressive disease. And so they're not going to get better. So you're really expecting um, things to get. We have, we have a, a, a family uh, right now that um, are looking at some really unrealistic expectations for their family member. And it's just a lot of education and telling them that at some point, although you want them to continue um, you know, doing Tai Chi, it's not going to really work once they're in that late stage of dementia. So you try to educate them, but until that really happens, they, you know, they tend not to get that. Um, and, it, and it's denial, maybe in many ways. Uh, there's un, uh, really financial um, issues. Dealing with not only our own finances, but also someone we care for can cause a caregiver to burn out. Medical bills for physicians' visits, treatments, or in-home care may accumulate quickly <clears throat> for caregivers on a fixed income. One study found that 60% of caregivers who support seniors reporting having to reduce the number of hours they work, taking a leave of absence from work, or making a career change based on having to care for a family member, half say they've gotten work late and have to leave early because of their caregiving responsibilities. And these changes can result in neg negative income changes and money stress. And, um, you know, each caregiver spends about $30,000 annually out of their own pocket for caregiving issues. Uh, depends, uh, chucks for the bed. Um, I know for my mom, we were paying um, because she wanted to stay in the home as long as possible. And uh, when we knew that um, she had mild cognitive impairment, we were paying for her lifeline and her cell phone. We were bringing groceries in. So you, you really end up spending a lot of your own money when you're caregiving, um, things that insurance just doesn't pay. The other thing is isolation for caregivers. That's very common because of the demands, um, whether they feel it's unsafe to leave their loved one at home or that they may have not any extra time. 
Uh, they may feel disconnected from family and friends. Uh, alternatively, caregiving can feel lonely because others may not understand what you're going through. If someone has never care, been a caregiver for someone before and you're talking to them, they, they're not going to get it. Not until they're in that situation. It's like everything else in life. Unless you're walking in their shoes, you are not going to understand it. The only person that's going to understand that is someone else who has been a caregiver. I like to call caregivers boots on the ground um, because often they are. They're the most important link to the type of care that one will receive in the healthcare practice. Um, you know, uh, it's important that we're, uh, we are there for the family members, whether they're in the hospital or they're going to the doctor or the dentist office, because we provide that information that may not be in that chart that will help that practitioner connect with someone. Um, on the level that they need to be connected. Uh, I was asked to be a caregiver in a POA for my brother-in-law's cousin. He was single, uh, never married, and he had cancer. So he asked me if I would be the um, POA caregiver for him. And I said, yes. And uh, I was taking him to uh, the oncologist's office. But he said to me, you know, I I, I, my back itches a lot and I feel like there's something there. And I lifted up his shirt and I said, um, hmm, it, you've got a little bit of a rash here. That could be shingles. And uh, he was going for chemotherapy that day. And I said, so we need to go to chemotherapy. And I, I would let um, you know, him do his kind of lead in with the doctor, but I was just in the background listening. And if he needed any um, any other input, I was there to do that. Nurse or no nurse, it's really important. And um, he kept telling the doctor before he was getting going off to do his chemo that uh, he felt that there was something on his back and it was really bothering him. The doctor said, oh, I'm sure it's nothing and kind of poo-pooed it. And I said, um, well, I took a look at it and it looks unusual to me and it might be shingles. Well, shingles, you know, is going to deplete your autoimmune system, and then you're going to get chemo, which is going to deplete your autoimmune system. It can be, it can have devastating effects. So he finally lifted up his shirt and said, oh yeah, that's shingles. We're canceling uh, chemo for today. You know, not that I, I'm patting myself on the back. I just happened to be there. This is what our caregivers are for, is to, to sometimes speak up for them as well. <clears throat> and had, um, you know, emotionally, um, you know, uh, my, uh, my husband or my, um, brother-in-law's cousin, uh, you know, his emotions were depleted. He wasn't going to pursue it. You know, it could have had devastating effects. So caregivers not only provide, um, physical care, but they're providing uh, emotional care as well. They have many caregivers. They uh, really encompass various roles, and sometimes they do the, all of those simultaneously. Um, they provide assistance with a variety of activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, and to let you know the difference between those if you don't know. Instrumental activities of daily living is usually the first to go with dementia, and that is things that you can do for yourself that keeps you independent, clean your house, take, um, you know, go grocery shopping, do your own finances, things like that. Activities of daily living are more your personal care. So caregiving, you're, you may be providing one or both of those, depending on the stage of the dementia. You may provide culturally appropriate comfort and support to them. They, you may advocate for their uh, their care and the recipients um, or the providers of that care. We ensure the safety of someone um, when we are taking care of them at home. We also, again, are the emotional supporter and they also coordinate care and make sure that plans are implemented, information is relayed, and that's what I call the quality sentinel. That day, I was nothing more than the quality sentinel for um, this man, because um, I was able to stop what could have been really um, difficult for this person. 
when we talk about signs of caregiver burnout, there are some signs that we need to look out. Um, we know that being a caregiver for someone you know and love can be very rewarding, and, but it can also be exhausting and frustrating. It's often emotionally, physically, and mentally draining, and it tends to limit your social life and can cause financial problems. 36% of family caregivers characterize this situation as a caregiver as highly stressful. And that's according to uh, caregiving in the US 2020 report in AARP. In the five years since ARP and um, the National Alliance for Caregiving last conducted their national survey, the proportion of caregivers describing their health as excellent or very good dropped um, from 48% to 41%. So we know it's getting rougher. Some of the um, symptoms of caregiver burnout is exhibiting or feeling anxious, avoiding uh, avoidance of people, maybe because you feel that you don't have time for that. Uh, a lot of people avoid other people because they don't want to bring any um, infections into the house. Um, we know that isolation and stress can cause depression. Exhaustion can cause depression, feeling of a loss of control over your life. You may feel very irritable. You may feel fatigued and have that loss of energy. You may lose interest in things that you um, enjoyed previously and neglecting your own health. There was a large percentage of caregivers that they, um, they polled and how many people had not seen a doctor, a dentist, or had their vision checked in over a year. So they tend to neglect their own needs. And here's the thing, if you can't take care of yourself, if you're not feeling good, you can't take care of someone else adequately. So it's really, really important for caregivers to make sure that they are taking care of themselves. Um, we look at things like body aches and pains, fatigue, frequent headaches, um, changes in your appetite. You might see a weight loss. You might see a weight gain. You're not sleeping well at night. Um, you know, you're tossing and turning. And you might, because of all this stress, we're going to see a decrease in your immune system and we're going to see an increase in your um, infection and viral rate. So if you're taking care of someone during cold and flu season, it's really, really important for you to get your flu shots, your COVID shots, and make sure that you're staying healthy because if you um, become sick while they're getting, uh, you know, while you're taking care of them, um, that's not going to be helpful. Plus, you can also get them sick and they're not, they're going to have less, the people you're caring for is going to have less reserve than you do. This is just a little quick video on the effects of chronic stress on your brain because it does affect your brain also. Welcome to this week's brain-based wellness news. In today's news, we look at the impact chronic stress has on your brain health and function. Approximately 90% of all doctor visits are due to stress-related health ailments. Chronic stress increases the stress hormone cortisol. Excess cortisol contributes to a wide variety of health problems, including weight gain, osteoporosis, digestive problems, hormone imbalances, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Cortisol also affects brain health and mental well-being with symptoms like memory loss, brain fog, anxiety, and worry. Some proactive steps you can take to reduce the impact stress has on your brain are eat a diet high in antioxidant-rich foods like fruit, vegetables, dark chocolate, and green tea. Get daily physical exercise. Start a daily meditation practice. Get plenty of sleep. And of course, chiropractic care has been found to help people better manage their stress. Get regular chiropractic checkups for the whole family. So um, whether you go to a chiropractor or not, um, you know, this is put out by a chiropractor, but it has really good information in, in the beginning. If you visit a chiropractor, continue seeing that chiropractor. If you don't, you may want to consider it. 
that's not the only choice uh, for healthcare. You really need to make sure that you're being seen at least um, once a year, or if you have any uh, symptoms, you should see your healthcare practitioner. A little bit about cortisol. If you've been under a lot of stress and you start noticing that you're getting a lot of um, you know, uh, extra uh, weight in the middle, more in the belly, it's probably from that release of cortisol. So what is compassion fatigue? Con compassion fatigue um, is something that happens suddenly. It's a loss of the ability to emphasize, uh, empathize and have compassion for other people, including the people um, that you, that person you may be caring for. Um, while burnout occurs over time, as, as a caregiver, you may feel overwhelmed by the stress of caring for a loved one. Confesh, uh, compassion fatigue, like I said, happens more suddenly. Um, it's caused by extreme stress that comes with um, empathizing with the suffering and traumatic experience of people that you care for. It's also studied in healthcare workers, but it happens to caregivers. We saw a lot of compassion fatigue during uh, COVID, obviously, with our healthcare providers because they were working 24 seven. They were working in very bad situations. <clears throat> Most of it was negative outcomes. And you get to a point where you just can't even empathize and have compassion for the people that you're caring for. And that in itself can change the care that you're giving people. So it's important not to get to that point. And that's why it's really important to take care of yourself. So let's talk about caregiver burnout. As caregivers, we tend to save self-care for last. I remember when I had my first child and I went to the mother baby um, classes and the nurse was teaching the new mom, she said, if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of others. And at that point, I thought <clears throat> I was a new mother. And I thought that was pretty selfish. That was a selfish way to think. But over the years, as I've been a parent and a caregiver, I've thought of this and it's become my mantra. And I realized that it is not selfish. If I don't care for myself, I cannot care for other people. Self-care means something different for each person. It could simply mean a nice bath for someone, at the end of a day, a glass of wine, and maybe watching an, an old movie uninterrupted, a nice cup of coffee mid-afternoon with no distractions. Maybe for someone it means a massage or aromatherapy, reading a book uninterrupted. There's a lot of ways that we can reach self-care. If you really wanna be there for your loved one, you've got to take care of yourself first. So when someone says to you, how can I help? How about an hour of their time a week? Now, I know some fam um, people, family members included, are not comfortable with caregiving. But if they could come in and stay for 30 minutes to an hour so you can get out for a walk or you can go to the grocery store or you can go to your favorite boutique or the library, that's really what you need. And that's important to share that with those people. We need to think about our physical wellness, when to say yes to others, make sure we're not saying no to ourselves. So we have to think about eating healthy, listen to your body for those signs of caregiver stress, get some exercise, even if it is having someone come over and you walking for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, get a good night's sleep. <clears throat> a lot of us, what we tend to do is take care of that person we're caregiving for, get them into bed. And then that's our time to catch up on things. Let it go till the next day. Get your relaxation, settle down before you go to sleep. Give yourself some downtime. Get rid of the um, electronics before you go to sleep. That will help in that bedroom. 
T no TVs in the bedroom, no electronics in the bedroom. Stay away from a blue screen for at least an hour to two hours before you go to sleep will help. Next is emotional wellness. And that is the ability to be in the present moment. Um, that is a major component of wellness. Just doing something like breathing and relaxation techniques um, is helpful. They have found, they've done studies on people who do meditation and it really starts sending more of those positive um, hormones out into your body and decreases the uh, cortisol. Also talking to someone um, about what's going on. And again, the best person is, is someone who is already a caregiver. So um, maybe getting into a support group or budding up with someone who's also caregiving so you can bounce things off of each other. Uh, like I said, a support group. I know sometimes it's really hard to get out to a support group, um, but I know we have a virtual support group on Monday evenings. So it's, you know, after dinner sometime, I think it starts at seven. It lasts about an hour and it's all done on Zoom. So you don't have to leave the house. It's really important to nurture those positive relationships that will help. Um, with that emotional wellness. I want you to just listen. This I pulled off of YouTube. You can pull meditation. You can pull breathing off of YouTube. Just go onto your computer, go into YouTube and um, type in one minute meditation. This is where I got this from. Close your eyes and we'll take a few moments to calm your mind and body. Soften your face your neck and shoulders. Do your best to fully let go. And turn your attention to the breath, the calming breath, the soothing breath. Take long, Slow breaths, full and deep. Breathing in, I am calm. Breathing out, I'm at peace. Close your eyes. You might find that one annoying. You're just going to have to search and see what works best for you. Um, you may not like the tone of their voice. You may not like what they're saying. Maybe you don't like that background. Um, watching water and fish. Uh, that's why some doctors had fish tanks in their offices. It reduces the blood pressure, just watching the fish swim. So <clears throat> you'll find what's best for you to do some breathing. There's also apps you can get on your phone that help you meditate. So you can do it anytime, any place. Um, if you meditate at least once or twice a day, you'll see your stress level go down. Um, cortisol is your body's main stress hormone. Your lifestyle and stress, stress levels affect the daily rhythms of cortisol in your body. So if you're stressed out day to day and spend a lot of time in a fight or flight state, you probably have high cortisol levels. Your health habits, your diet environment, and even your thoughts influence your cortisol levels. So too much or too little of cortisol can have a negative impact on your blood pressure, your blood sugar levels, your immune system, your mood, your memory, and more. Endorphins are neurotransmitters. They're chemicals that pass along signals from one neuron to the next. Neurotransmitters also play a key role in the function of the central nervous system and can either prompt or suppress further signaling of nearby, uh, nearby neurons. Endorphins are produced as a response to that stimuli, especially stress, fear, or pain. They originate in various parts of your body, such as your pituitary gland, your spinal cord, and different parts of your brain. 
there's at least 20 different kinds of endorphins and there are endorphins that actually um what they have um related it to have uh, more a morphine type of a pain control effect but there's also morphines uh, i'm sorry endorphins that make you feel better they make you feel good and so one of the things that helps increase your endorphins is laughter so Laughter is a good thing to keep in your um, in your program every day because it increases your pain tolerance because of those morphine and dwarf type endorphins. It burns calories or costs, you'll, you'll have to laugh a lot during the day to really see a significant weight loss. Um, it eases anxiety and tension. It relieves stress and improves the mood. It really helps with every part of your body when you laugh. But it also brings an emotional high, which enables the problems to be seen from a different perspective, especially those of a stressful, stressful nature. Do you ever remember being in an argument with someone and you're in the midst of this argument and something funny happens and you both crack up laughing? You can't get back to that argument. And so that's what we say when you see things from a different perspective with laughing. There's a lot of ways that you can bring laughter to yourself and to maybe someone that you're caring for. You can watch video shorts on YouTube. Um, when I do a laughter program, I have everybody, um, I show, uh, you know, the candy um, conveyor belt of I Love Lucy and the dental scene from uh, Tim Conway and um, Carol Burnett's show. Uh, you can watch movies, you can read jokes to each other, the funnies. There's just a lot of ways that you can laugh. And um, if you're working with someone with dementia and you're not sure that you can get them to laugh, the best thing that you can put up are laughing babies and laughing animals. And I will tell you that my six-year-old uh, grandson will still come over and say, Gigi, can you put the laughing babies on your computer? And we sit here and we laugh and we smile. And so that's something easy that you can do to kind of change that perspective. The next thing is you want to um, set goals and um, make your to-do list for the day. My son says uh, the first thing he puts on his to-do list is write a to-do list because then he figures he can cross it off. And at least he, every day he has one thing crossed off his list. But make your to-do list every day. Be grateful that you got to check something off. You're not going to get everything checked off your to-do list. It's okay. You've got the next day to do it. Limit the list to the most important things that you want to accomplish. Maybe today is the, the day that you're going to change all the bed sheets. Maybe today's the day that you're going to sit down and do your bills for the month. Maybe today's the day that you're going to um, to call a, uh, a friend that you've been trying to connect with. But be honest about what you can accomplish. You're not going to be able to put a new door on a hinge when you're caring for someone. You're not going to be able to put a new roof on your house when you're caring for someone. So make this list attainable for yourself. Getting to the store to go grocery shopping, um, you know, making a, a, a meal for a couple of days and freezing them. Those are the type of things that you want to set. You can also set goals that um, you'll need help with. And that's when I talk about really reaching out to other people for help. Um, and that'll be on the next slide. But in this one, um, we talk about educating yourself. And, you know, in the words of Maya Angelou, she said, I, I did then what I, I knew how to do, but now that I know better, I do better. You might look at yourself in a year from caregiving and have figured out, because it's going to take you a good year to figure out a routine and what works for you and what makes that person happy and healthy, as healthy as you can keep them. So make sure that you educate yourself. If they have dementia, 
read about the type of dementia they have. If they have Parkinson's, read about that. If they have COPD, um, get educated on that. That will always help. There's There are support groups for everything online. We need to communicate to people what we need. So we need to, when we're doing that to-do list, write something on that to-do list that you know you can't do. Maybe it's changing all the light bulbs in the house, or maybe there's a light switch that's out. And when someone calls you and says, I'd love to help you out, but I don't know what to do. You might say, John, you know what? I could use your help changing all the light bulbs in my house. I need help changing this, this um, you know, light switch out. Those are the things that you know you can't do. And maybe that person's not good with caregiving, but they want to help. And this is the way. So at the bottom of that list, put those things that you know you can't do, but you would need help with. And then when someone calls and says, what can I do to help? You've got that list handy. Be forgiving. Forgiving is not something that we do for other people. It's, it's what we do for ourselves to move on. So if you're dealing with anger and frustration, especially with other family members, it can cause physical and emotional changes to yourself and to others. So we have to kind of forgive, forgive them, forgive ourselves and move on. Now, for some people that need to have a little bit of time, uh, they need a break. They can't do this. They're getting to that point of turn um, of burnout. There is something called respite care. Respite care is usually something that's done in a, an assisted living or a long-term care community, it's usually anywhere from a couple of days to um, about a month. It depends on what you need. They're usually pretty negotiable as far as um, what you need as, as a time away from them. Maybe you wanna go on vacation. Maybe you're going to a family wedding and you thought about not going. Think about respite care. And um, and usually it's done at a community. Some home health will bring in 24-hour respite caregivers. But, um, you know, they will get the care that they need and you will get the um, relaxation that you need. If you want um, to take a picture of this or if you need this, I can send this to you. Um, and this is some respite care information. There's a lot of caregiver um, sites online. Um, this, I just typed in respite care information and I was able to come up with four websites that I looked at that looked like they were pretty good as far as what respite care um, uh, included and, um, and it went state by state. So it's really helpful if you need that. We always have to reflect on the awards um, that caregiving gives. It's a real esteem booster. Uh, it, it may be a reflection of living up to your personal ideas and beliefs or a promise that you made to a person to provide care. Whatever the reason that you are a caregiver, some rewards are hidden while some are very obvious. Um, and so, think about some of the rewards. Um, you know, when I reflect back on my time with my father-in-law, my children were in high school and um, they had firsthand interaction with someone who was aging with dementia because of a stroke and how they needed to ch um, change their um, communication with him they needed to continue to respect him and treat him with dignity. And not every family has that opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one so close in their house. And yes, some days it was difficult. My, my kids, we didn't have a basement. So um, our, you know, our family room was the area that the kids would have to entertain their, um, their friends. And so we had to adjust a few things, but they learned to share their family with an older person. And I think they all had some life lessons in that. We have to really look at redefining our expectations and modifying some traditions. 
you may look at how you're celebrating the holidays. Consider the needs of that loved one during the holidays and what um, what they're experiencing. If they have dementia, what stage of dementia are they in? Uh, if they have Parkinson's, where are they at with that? Same for COPD, congestive heart failure. What are they able to do? What are they able to tolerate? The, the um, more our chronic illnesses become more progressive, it can increase their anxiety. So sometimes we think we're doing a great thing by, you know, um, putting them in the middle of a Christmas celebration, and that might cause a lot of undue anxiety for them, especially with someone living with uh, dementia. So um, you may want to rethink how you're handling um, events in your family. So um, <clears throat> I do do a program around Christmas, and it's called When um, Dementia Has a a place at your holiday table that I talk specifically about people with dementia and what is important for them um, to have or not have during the holiday celebrations that will not cause them any undue anxiety or difficulty. So um, look for that. I think it's in November, but be happy with the quality time that you spend with someone. If it means having a smaller um, birthday celebration and maybe once a week, someone, uh, you know, family comes over, um, a member of the family comes over and celebrates their birthday with them instead of having 20 people at one time, that might be overwhelming for them. So um, make it smaller and easier. Have people bring things. Uh, make sure that if you're including food, it's food that they're going to be able to tolerate. I want to keep the noise and a lot of the uh, loudness down. And um, that'll help decrease the anxiety for people who are dealing with chronic illnesses. I already talked about sharing your wish list, adding things on your own list. Like Tiny Buddha said, if I waited until I had all my ducks in a row, I'd never get across the street. So we just have to sometimes gather them up and make a run for it. And that's what that wish list is for. With those things, uh, I haven't gotten out to cut my grass this week. Can you do that for me? Um, you know, I uh, need to take some stuff to the um, the cleaners. Do you think you could pick that up for me? Or can you spare me 10 minutes so I can go? Sometimes that's all you need is that 10 minute car ride to something as simple as as the dry cleaners to make you feel like, oh, I got out. I took a breath there a breath of fresh air, I rolled down my windows. Maybe I drove around the block a few more times than I would have, but you get that time away. So again, share your wish list with people. We have to accept and adapt. We have to ask for help. And we have to look at um, what we are grateful for. Gratitude's what we have into enough and more, and it turns denial into acceptance chaos into order, confusion into clarity. And it really makes sense of our past. It brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. And did you know that they're doing brain studies on people and they see more neural activity in people who are thinking positive thoughts, have gratitude, um, and uh, they're looking at that. And actually this next video will talk about that. Research shows that adopting an attitude of gratitude, simply expressing appreciation and being more thankful, can measurably improve your overall well-being. For example, studies prove that gratitude can increase happiness, reduce depression, and strengthen resiliency. Grateful people often experience reduced blood pressure, less chronic pain, increased energy, even longer lives. People who purposefully express more gratitude report higher self-esteem than those who don't, and they're more likely to help others. A pro-social behavior also linked to greater happiness. People who capture grateful thoughts before bed sleep better than those who don't. Why so many positive changes? Because gratitude actually rewires our brains, kickstarting the production of dopamine and serotonin. Like antidepressants, these feel-good neurotransmitters activate the bliss center of the brain, creating feelings of happiness and contentment. 
This appears to be self-perpetuating. Research suggests that with regular practice, you'll train your prefrontal cortex to better appreciate and retain positive experiences and thoughts, and to deflect the negative ones. Here are a few simple ways to deliberately cultivate that attitude of gratitude. Celebrate minor accomplishments. Think about what you have, rather than dwelling on what you don't. Tell the people in your life something you appreciate about them. Tell yourself too. Volunteer, hold a door for a stranger, or simply smile more, and you'll probably feel better, as kindness and giving are connected to gratitude. Similar positive brain changes can occur from regular meditation and mindfulness. Keep a daily gratitude journal using an old-fashioned notebook or a high-tech app. The science is clear. Give gratitude a go. You'll be thankful you did. So today, I um, appreciate all of you being here today. And I'm very grateful that I had this time and opportunity to talk to you about caregiving. And I appreciate um, Dina being on with me today. So thank you, everyone. And I will open it up to questions. Chris, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, I think the the takeaway as being a caregiver myself is is remembering that I need to do for me because if I don't, I can't do for them. You got it. That's really the 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 key to it. And I know um, for many of us how we grew up, that was selfish. You know, I'm, I come from a, a guilt ridden Catholic family. So, you know, um, and, you know, especially with, with females back in the fifties and, and earlier, it was, you know, you were the caregiver for the family and that was your role. Um, uh, we know that not to be that true anymore and that we have we can give greater things when we do take time for ourselves so it's very important that we do that um you know gratitude i think is really important and um you can write it in a journal every night before you go to bed you know one thing that you were grateful for and it might be i'm grateful that i got one thing off my list today it doesn't have to be dramatic and beautiful it's one thing that you're grateful for, I'm grateful that I got to sit on the patio today while mom was napping. That's that's something to be grateful for. And those are important things. That's going to shift that brain. I agree. I 100% agree with you, Chris. I think, too, we've had some families recently um, reach out to ElderWorks and have shared, you know, they're the caregiver and they have guilt about what their loved one's behaviors are or things they say and you know we refer them to this video and different things like that that when they can focus on the on the gratitude versus like their guilt they don't own their loved one's behaviors um do you have more to say on that when it comes yeah. to behaviors that their loved one could share there's a lot of dynamics and behaviors um with someone living with dementia there's personality changes and there is, um, you know, there's uh, anxiety. That's just typical of dementia, um, usually in the middle to the later stages. <clears throat> you might see some social isolation. You might see some suspiciousness in that first part of dementia. That's just part of the disease. And you have to keep reminding yourself that that's just part of the disease. You can't take it personally. If you had a fractured relationship with this person you now have to care give for, it's not, it may not get better and it may even stay the same. It could get worse. And, but you can't expect that miracle to happen. And what you have to do is make sure that you're equipped to handle that. And if that means that you need to talk to someone about that fractured relationship, that if that's going to keep you healthy, do it. Some people, when they get sick because they've lost that control and they've lost their independence, are angry. And you're going to be the source of that anger. And again, you can't take that personally. Now, 
that said, you don't have to take verbal abuse or physical abuse either. And you have to set those limits. You know, if it's dementia, you know, it's going to be hard to set those because you'll have to remind them every time they do it. But if they have maybe COPD or something else, when you're taking care of a chronic illness, you can say to them, I think it's okay to say, I'm trying my very best, but I don't need to be treated like this. I'm doing, you can ask me or tell me in a different tone of voice what you need me to do. And I will be happy to do that for you. You have to set those boundaries with them because you shouldn't be abused. And yeah, thank you for that. It's sometimes it's just that loss of control. You know, um, I mean, I think about when you are sick and you feel miserable, aren't you crabby? Part of it is because you don't feel good, but it's because maybe you can't do anything about it and it, and you're feeling helpless and that's helplessness comes out as anger. So. Yeah, no. I think Chris, you'll find in a lot of the support groups, they talk about behaviors. So. Yeah. I don't see any other questions in chat. Chris, okay. Again, I, we always take nuggets of, of such great wealth and, and thoughts and, and things that we can put into practice each time you speak. So I thank you very much. Um, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, friendly reminder, ElderWorks Aging Better Expo is set for August 14th at Stonegate and Hoffman Estates. Um, please check that out. Um, you can go to our website or give us a call if you have any questions. We also have a bunch of new um, and upcoming topics. So I uh, would request you take a look at our website or sign up for our consumer newsletter. Um, but know that ElderWorks is also here as a resource. Um, these presentations are great. Um, we do have a support group. We do have a book club. Um, there's a new support group hopefully coming in the next mm, couple of months um, so that we have resources for you. But no, you're not alone in that journey. We have senior advisors who are here to listen and to help guide you. Um, Chris and Arlene, our education staff, are always here for additional questions. Um, so know you're not alone on this journey and we wish you well. Chris, anything else? No, I think it's all said. All enjoy right, everybody. Have a great So enjoy the afternoon. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.